Um, mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, Father, we just come before you this evening, and we thank you for all that you're doing in our midst. I thank you for this evening with my brothers and sisters to, to celebrate your words in our lives and to celebrate taking on the beauty of of your scriptures that bring life to us and set us free and how your word tells us that the truth will set us free and so lord we just honor you and give you glory and and lord we are thankful again for everything that you do and so lord we devote this time to you and ask for your wisdom and your insights continuously as we study your word Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe, who sanctifies us in your instructions and instructs us regarding the study of Torah in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. By the way, just to fill everybody in, we had a fantastic, um, fantastic Hall, uh, Hanukkah party. I thought it was fantastic. We had a, a great crowd. Um, that was really fun. Um, we had uh, a, a, wow, ton of food. a ton of food. Praise God. I wish we had that ton of food every Shabbat. That'd be awesome. Um, we had to bring out two extra tables. Yeah, two extra yeah. tables. Uh, eight people at each table and not every table was fully filled. But we had close to 80 people for those of you that came. That was awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. that is a great turnout. Um, and, you know, the kids were having fun with the games. Um, we, no one danced. We had the dance floor, but no one danced. We couldn't get anybody to dance. But um, uh, there was just a lot of wonderful things that happened and just a fellowship together. Tonight is the fourth night of Hanukkah. So if you're lighting the candles, um, we need to do the fourth night. So once you get the candle over here, we'll, we'll light it. And okay. we will do that. We'll do the fourth uh, night uh, with the fourth candle tonight uh, in our study, and then we'll make that part of it. So that way we always remember that we did this study on the fourth night of Hanukkah, and uh, that'll be fun. So we, Linda's got it all situated. I got a lighter over here, sweetie. That's what I was saying. Okay. 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 Where would you like it? Um, you can put it right here for right now, and then it'll be really bright, and everybody will be lightened up, and it'll burn all everybody's eyeballs. <laughs> yes. But uh, we can we can do it. So then we'll move it after we light it. Okay. Okay. So let me turn this a little bit so everybody can see it. There we go. Oh, it's crooked. Come on over here. Sit down, honey. I don't know what you're doing. Here, let me get some of these uh, stuck under here. Okay. And then once we get it lit, we'll move it, and hopefully we won't destroy anything. When we're moving it. Oops. Did I kill it? Yeah. Oops, it's the fourth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to move because we have the fan going up above us. So Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kichanu b'mitzvotah, v'tzivanu lehalikner, lehalikner, shel shal, I mean, shel chanukah. Oops, I got, somebody caught me, she caught me, that was awesome, she's like, huh? <laughs> and it's good because see, I'm not on screen. She is. So that was her voice. <laughs> Amen. So we're going to light the Shamash candle. And with the Shamash candle, we're going to light each one. Oh, look at that. Two at fan. one. Yeah, the fan's going to really take them out. So we're going to have to move this back to the table as gently as you possibly can. Okay. All right. So tonight is, oops, let me get this going right down here. All right. Oh, yeah. See, they'll melt. They'll burn really fast really with that. Fast. Yeah. Okay. Nice and smooth and slow, honey. Do not destroy. Can she do it? She's doing it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All righty. How many people are actually uh, uh, lighting the candles every night? All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So let's go to gallery. Excellent. We have more and more people connecting. So this is really good. Uh, we just lit the candles and they'll be behind us. So you guys can see the little candles behind us. That's great. All right. So everybody open up to Galatians chapter four. And I think this has been great. Um, how many people before we start real quick, just looking at everybody here in the gallery uh, view here um, are learning. We heard some people speak back 
to us uh, last week. Denise spoke about it. Anybody else gained anything out of last week that you feel like you want to share about tonight? Uh, Linda? Oh, you were talking about last week in specific. Yeah. And well, okay. When you talked about the Talk louder so we can feasts hear. and festivals, knowing that it was, it makes sense that if they were talking to Gentiles celebrating essentially pagan feasts and festivals, that's what they were speaking against, not God's feasts. Not and God's festivals. feasts and festivals. And that's right. That's a huge insight. I think a lot of people really recognized last week. And I think that is something that is really important because when you read Galatians from a very modern Christian perspective and you read that, and we're going to re reread that real quick and we'll go back and take a look at it. It's really easy to dismiss anything that is Jewish, anything that has to do with a Judaic system, especially in that time frame of, of dismissing it and saying, well, this is all bad. It's under, it's the baby. You throw the baby out with the bath water. It's all dirty, all disgusting, all that kind of thing. Jacob, you had your hand raised? Yeah, it was just like this week I was having like revelations about uh about stuff we talked about, which was um saying that you know that in Mashiach that you're free from the curse of the law, which is which is death. So he frees you from death, but that doesn't mean that you're still not under the law. Right. So you're under the law, but you're free from the curse of the law, which is death. And then I keep applying this to my previous engagement with with the Chabad because. In order to escape the curse of the law, they created more of their own man-made rules. So now they're following man-made rules and they're ignoring the Torah. So now they're even more under a burden. So I just I find it funny that like I keep having these revelations like only in Mashiach can you be free from death. And but you still have to follow the law in a way. So I just think it's great. Like well, and it, it reminds me, as you were saying that, it reminds me of the passage where Yeshua was really disappointed in the Pharisees and and the leaders of Jerusalem at this time. And he was he was he was rebuking them. And you remember the one rebuke that he gave me, he says, You guys go way off overseas to just win one convert, and then you turn that person more into the son of hell than you are. Um, and and when he rebuked them by saying that, is that he is they he was trying to get across to them that your traditions are adding so much more of a burden on the people that they've become more stringent and more controlled by this world system and more controlled by by uh a non-freedom stuff that the torah does not demand to the point where they're lost their souls are so far gone that they're even more gone than the disciples this is why it's really important that we look at that passage i i shared it in uh, the bulletin a couple of weeks ago, or was it this week? I can't remember exactly when, but I was talking about the yeast of the Pharisees. You guys remember that passage, the yeast of the Pharisees? And if those of you read my bulletin points, or if you get onto the website and you look at the updates, every week I put a little from the rabbi in there, just about uh, 400 words that I put in there, but it's from the rabbi every week that goes in there. And I was talking about the yeast of the Pharisees. And a lot of times we read that and because we celebrate Passover, people are quick to say the yeast, yeast represents sin. And that isn't really what Yeshua was referring to when he was talking about the Pharisees. In this particular passage and within context, he was talking about the teachings of the Pharisees, which is the influence of the Pharisees. So what he was saying here is beware of the influence that the Pharisees are bringing into your life. And, and so in, in how do we apply that in today's world is that we be that we need to be very careful with the influences that we have in our lives. And when we look at Galatians, we see the influencers and the receivers of, of Shaul's letter. And it really boils down to that. So much so that Shaul could spend a lot of time pointing out all the influencers and talking about their sins and all this kind of stuff. And even though he refers to the influencers in Galatians, he actually reverts that back. And, and by reverting that back, he, he tries to not focus on the influencers and he starts focusing on the truth of what they need to do. And so this is the same kind of thing that, that Yeshua was doing with his disciples. Beware the yeast of the Pharisees. Watch out for their influence. Watch out for their teachings because their teachings will lead you down a path that you don't want to go. And it'll it'll make you worse off than what you were before, and um, so this is the kind of stuff that we have to get, and that's a great revelation that Jacob was talking about. Uh, uh, Mary, uh, oh, never, never mind. Uh, did anybody else have something else that they wanted to add to that? Um, 
Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, let's continue on. Let everybody open up to Galatians chapter four. And then tonight, though, we're going to start at uh, verse eight because I want to reiterate some of the things that we talked about. And again, I'm using the revised revised standard version. And part of it is this is why I, I enjoy this Bible. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this Bible and I would recommend it. I mean, not everything you're going to read in here is going to line up with a uh, Christian thought or messianic Jewish thought. But when you read here and you read here on, uh, this is the, uh, the Jewish annotated new Testament. Okay. So this is a pretty thick Bible and it's just a new Testament, but it's the Jewish annotated uh, new Testament because uh, it, it's in the revised standard version, which is an okay version. It's not the best version in the world. I actually enjoy the uh, ESV. If you're going to really get into a scholarly version, the English standard version. But this one has Jewish scholars that that make a uh, commentary on the New Testament. So this has Jewish commentary within it. So this is actually something that is really interesting. And Mark Nanos is one of my favorite Jewish scholars out there. And he actually comments a lot on the book of Romans. And I would encourage you that if you ever, you ever get this Bible, this New Testament, Read everything you possibly can in there on the book of Romans and what Mark Nano says, because I think more than any Jewish scholar out there and Messianic Jewish scholar, by the way, and any Christian scholar out there. OK, you had all three of those. Mark Nanos has nailed Paul to the T. He has really done a fabulous job of giving Paul a fair shake at first century at a first century judaic system and it's absolutely amazing and it's awesome so i want to encourage you guys all if you do get that but anyhow for our study for galatians lately what i've been using is the revised standard version and i have linda reading out of the tlv every once in a while and regardless of what passage you guys are using or bible you're using whether it's the niv or the king james i think we'll get the it's great to use different translations at times because it's easy to get stuck with one translation and not really see the full understanding of what's taking place. So when we start at Galatians chapter four, verse eight, and again, he's talking here to them, he goes formally. So again, he's talking to the addressees, the addressees we believe are, are non-Jewish believers in Galatia that he's referring to and they're, they're, uh, they've been brought in. No worries, Thomas, welcome to tonight's study. Um, okay, so he's talking to, so watch how he says he uses this term formally. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. She's got her menorah going to her Hanukkah. We got our Hanukkah in the back. My big head is blocking it right now. But if I move over to the side, you can see the, the light on it. But um, it says, formally, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not gods. Now, however, that you have come to know God or rather to be known by God. How can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? So this is obvious that he's not telling, he's not talking to them about a Jewish way of life. And this is where Christians miss this all the time. And it saddens me when I see this because they're absolutely missing this incredible uh, insight that is here because they're quick to say, again, law equals bad. Grace equals good, uh, Torah equals bad, uh, the Jews equal bad, the Christians equal good. I mean, there's a lot of things that have come up in between that, and that's unfair. So we see this here, and then verse uh, it continues on. How can you want to be enslaved to them again? And then verse 10, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid that my work for you may have been wasted. Now, when you read that from Pauline perspective, from a Pauline, that's kind of a scholarly term. But if you read it from Paul's perspective, okay, and you read it from a Pauline understanding of him being a Pharisee of Pharisees, an observer of the Torah, zealous for the Torah, um, went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, it kind of seems strange to all of a sudden switch him around and say that somehow he's being his uh, his work is being wasted on the Galatians because they went back to doing God's God's Torah or went back to following the feasts and festivals of God. That doesn't make sense to a non-Jewish world. There, there's like, what, what feasts and festivals are you talking about? They would have understood when he said these things that he would, uh, they would have understood completely what he was saying. They weren't talking, Shaul wasn't talking about Jewish feasts and festivals here. He was talking about 
the uh, annual paganistic feast that they celebrated with their gods. And that's why he's saying, you know, formerly you guys didn't know gods and you were enslaved to these so-called gods. And, but now that you're known by God, by Yahweh, by the main God, why are you going back to doing any of this stuff? So this is kind of a rebuke that he's giving them here and saying it shouldn't be what you should be doing here. You should be honoring God and, and following his instructions, his ways, and not going back to what you did before. OK, so he goes and then that's why he says in verse 11, I am afraid that my work for you may have been wasted and by saying that. And then he goes into verse 12, friends, I beg you. So he's pleading with them. He's giving them a huge cry. Be, uh, be, uh, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. And what does you mean? What do you think he means when he says that right there? Anybody? What is one of the things that he liked to say, Shaul liked to say when he was teaching, as he says, follow me as I follow Messiah. Follow me as I follow Messiah. So what Yeshua, what, what Shaul was doing here was he's saying, I've, I too have become set free and become enslaved to Yahweh by grace. And I'm walking according to his ways. Therefore, I want you to become like me because I've become like you. I've become free. I've become set free. I've been saved and born again. And I am, I am before the Father now, not on my own merits of keeping the Torah, but understanding that I am set free by the, by the work of the cross, by the work of Yeshua and the power of that. And so that's what he's getting across. And listen, you guys weren't doing these pagan feasts and festivals to find some kind of freedom. You are enslaved to this. So now I encourage you to follow, be like me, be free, be free, be set free um, spiritually, emotionally, physically, in our physical bodies and everything else, our spiritual bodies and our spirit. Be set free so that we can honor, we can honor God because he's given us this freely through faith. And he, that's why he connects it to Abraham. Okay. So then we see this here where he says is because I am for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. You know that it was because of a physical infirmity that I first announced the gospel to you. Though my condition put you to the test, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God, as a Messiah Yeshua. Pretty powerful. So he's getting across to them how you guys once, once received me and brought me in and how you guys have received everything about me. Get back to that. Get back to that. It's almost like, uh, getting back to basics, not losing your first love, you know, remaining in your first love. Okay, so we see that. And then he says, um, have now I become your enemy by telling you the truth? So this is pretty important. This is really hard to do. Sometimes the truth isn't pleasant. Sometimes walking in obedience has nothing to do with our happiness. Has anybody ever experienced that in your life? Is simply walking in truth or walking with God uh, does not guarantee happiness. I heard a, yeah, a Jacob's hand went up. I, I've seen it. Every one of us have experienced that. Uh, let me ask you something. When you guys were little kids and your parents said to go clean your room, was it better to obey your parents or to fill your happiness during that time? <laughs> right? You know, what happens is that we have to honor God. So when we honor God, sometimes the things he asks of us doesn't really, it, it's not an emotional response. And I think that unfortunately we're living in a day and a society when everything is done emotionally. I don't feel good, or I don't feel this way, or I feel like a male, or I feel like a female, or I feel like a cow, a donkey, a donut, whatever you feel like. And, and we base our theology based off feelings, and we base our understanding of the scriptures by feelings, and we don't really truly understand that if we just simply walk according to God's ways, we will find an inner joy, and that inner joy that we find, the scriptures tell us, becomes our strength, but it's not based on emotions. It's based on honoring God and honoring his word, and this is what Shaul is trying to get across to them. He goes, for I testified that had it been possible, you would have torn out, um, well, let's see, let's go back here real quick. Um, uh, verse 12, verse 13, you know that it was because of the physical infirmity that I first announced the gospel to you. Though my condition put you to the test, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God, as Messiah Yeshua. When, what has become of the goodwill you felt? Okay, for I testified that had it been possible, you would have torn out my, your eyes and given them to me. That's a, an amazing 
an amazing um, uh, understanding here. So Shaul's talking about his infirmity, probably being um, uh, struggling with his eyesight or something like this that he was dealing with at this time. And he's telling them, listen, man, you, when you guys first knew me and the way you treated me, you guys would have torn out your eyes and given to me if that would have worked. Um, so he was talking, he's commending him how awesome it is. And then, but he's telling him now, he goes, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? So this is really important. Sometimes we have to share the truth. And when we share the truth, it's not good. Sometimes when we share the truth, it hurts. Sometimes when we tell somebody the truth, I recently had to tell somebody the truth about their attitude and they have turned it into a huge thing. They've turned it into something that doesn't need to be turned into what it's been turned into. Um, but if I love somebody, I'm going to be honest with them. I'm going to tell them the truth. And I would expect people to do the same to me, despite how much, uh, despite how uncomfortable it is. And sometimes how, how much I don't want to hear it. <laughs> right? I mean, have we all been that way before where somebody comes and talks to us and we wish they would have never told us in the first place, but after you you hear it, after you listen to it, if you don't get defensive, you know, it says it's to a man's credit that he can overlook an offense. When we actually put ourselves in that kind of a situation and we move away from that, that offense, um, um, it's, it's amazing because uh, we see a, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, we see, we see the blessings of God behind it by simply not getting offended. So if we choose to not get offended, we choose to do the right thing. We choose to walk right with God. And despite of what people tell us, we will find ourselves more happier than we could ever imagine to be. So anyhow, that was a long rendition there. But um, so verse 17, they make much of you. Or did somebody have a question? I heard a, a thing in the background. Hold on one second. Let me open it up to gallery. Did somebody have a question? Yeah, Jarrett, go ahead, unmute. I was wondering if uh, this, the heart of the Galatians that they would have given their eyes to Paul, if this was in any reference to the thorn in his side, maybe that was the uh, limitation, was his eyesight. Some people have tried to connect that over the years, and I would think it's two different things here. Um, I believe that that wasn't necessarily a thorn in his side, but maybe he was having bad eyesight or his eyes started going bad. And it could have been that, but I think the thorn in his flesh had to do with an internal battle. Um, I share it in the commentary that I'm writing for the Messianic Jewish Publishing Society. I'm writing a commentary on First Timothy, um, on First and Second Timothy, and the commentary. What I, when I what I do is I talk about the thorn in his side. Was I believe it had to do with uh, if you look at Acts chapter five, you we get. An, a really good introduction of Nick, uh, not Nick, and Amos, uh, Rabbi, um, 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 my mind's blank, Gamaliel. Okay, we get a really good insight of who Gamaliel is, and we find out later on that Shaul was a disciple by Shaul's own words, he was a disciple of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5 is telling the, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, when they were getting ready to persecute, who was it? Peter and John, I believe. Um, he was getting ready to persecute them. And Gamaliel stands up and says, guys, let's not do this thing here. You remember, if we do this, if we do this, we may find ourselves fighting against God. And he brings up, you remember this movement and that movement and this movement. And when he brought that up, he says it all faded to nothing. He goes, but we better be careful because, because of these guys. If we find ourselves fighting the wrong battle here, we're going to be fighting God and not, not man. And then all of a sudden, you don't hear anything about him in chapter 6. But what we do read about uh, Gamaliel, and, and not, I'm not so much Gamaliel, but what we do read about in chapter 6 is it says a great number, a great number of the Sanhedrin and priests came to know the Lord, became followers of Yeshua. And then in chapter 7, we see Shaul uh, being the one who approved the stoning of Stephen. Now, we talked about Acts, pretty much one chapter of the book of Acts kind of covers a year. So you take this whole process of a two-year span here from chapter 5 to chapter 7, roughly, okay, that's a rough estimate. But you take those two chapters, and you take about two of those years in that process, Something happened to Shaul because if he was a, a, a disciple of Gamaliel, he would have by he would have never, ever, ever gone after this movement of Yeshua because the, the disciples followed the very 
words of their rabbi. They treated him like, you know, like, like gold, right? Everything that the rabbi said, they treated it like gold. They would memorize everything. That's why we have different renditions of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they call that the synoptic gospels. They're very close, but they would have memorized the passages, the teachings of their rabbis who would have taught in what they're, what's called doublets and triplets. So Rabbi, you know, Yeshua does it all the time. He'll speak on one thing and then he'll say the exact same thing again. And when he says it, he says it a different way. And then sometimes he'll do a triplet. And by the time you hear this doublet or triplet, if you're a disciple, it's very easy to catch on to one of those stories and hold it to your own. And they would force themselves to memorize those things. And so this is a long answer to what you're saying, Jared. But I believe what we're seeing here is the thorn in his flesh is going against Gamaliel and destroying the body of believers. And being the one who was testified to that when they destroyed somebody or when they stole, stoned Stephen, they brought the cloak of Stephen over and they laid it down at the feet of Shaul for his approval. And I think the reason why is because he lost his teacher. He lost his Rebbe. He lost his master to this movement of, of the way, this movement of uh, Messiah followers. And he couldn't deal with that. It's almost like losing your children to a cult or losing your father or your mother to a cult type of thing. So in Paul's mind, because he was zealous for the Torah and he loses his leader or his Rebbe or his rabbi, he's going to go after those who are responsible. And I think this is more of the thorn in the flesh, which is why we see throughout the scriptures where, where Shaul constantly is saying uh, stuff like, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua, right? He talks about... Uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. He talks about being fully for, forgiven. He he uses passages all the time that seem like he's experienced this to such a degree that he's preaching to himself instead of just preaching to us and telling us what we need to do. So when you see the language of Shaul, so I good question. I people have come to that conclusion right there, uh, Jarrett, of what you said. Do they see the eyesight as being the thorn in the flesh? I see it as something totally different. Um, I think that it, it may be a part of it because, I mean, who wants to go blind? I don't want to go blind. Do you want to go blind? Uh, Linda doesn't want to go blind. She's trying to take a nap right now. You guys will just have to excuse her when her eyes her eyes get heavy. Um, she just she didn't have any dinner, so she's tired. She works so hard that when she sits down for a Bible study, she starts going. Ugh. Okay, it's not because I'm boring at all. I'm I'm actually very interesting, but <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, <laughs> but that was a great question, Jarrett. I think that is really good. Uh, does anybody else have something that they want to add or or say before we move on on what they're they're discovering in this? This is really good. Good question, Jarrett. Um, I would argue that some people would actually say that that's exactly what it means, and I would differ from that. Okay. All right. Well, let's move. Oh, go ahead, Thomas. I have kind of a third opinion to it, I guess. I, I kind of look at all of the punishment and all of the 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 physical pain and and the the, the beatings and the, the scourging and everything else that Paul went through that by the time he was writing these letters, he was physically in a lot of pain. And sure. he may have been going blind also, but I do kind I, I never thought of yours. And that that's gonna I'm gonna have to think on that one a little bit because I just really looked at the fact that. I know the older I get, the more I abused my body just being silly. I, I wasn't beat on. I wasn't scourged. I wasn't literally, you know, almost 39 lashes and 40 kills you pretty much. So I always looked at it as though he was looking for some relief of his actual physical pain. And the Lord is like, that's what keeps you on my track. Because you know where you're, you're your reward is going to be the body that you get when you're here, when you're with me. For right now, this pain keeps you on the straight and narrow, so to speak. So right. that was kind of mine. <laughs> yeah, and no, and I, I thought that for many years too. And I think that that's where I stayed for a lot of years because, you know, our bodies will remind us how, how humble we really are. You know, when I, every day I get up, I feel pain all the time. And my ankles, my knees, my hands. 
everything. And so it's easy to look at that. But when Paul talks about this, this thorn in the flesh, it's something that seems to be greater. And when I look at the things that I did in my past and I look at the spiritual sin that I've committed or some things that I've done in my life or some beliefs that I stood that hurt and damaged other people, I have a hard time forgiving myself of that stuff than I do with the physical pains type of thing. So I think I think it could be anything, and I think that all of those are good. Um, I actually do a good argument in the book that I'm writing, which you guys have got um, a snippet of what I, I argue in there. But I, but you, when you look at what Paul says to the congregations throughout all of the diaspora, and he argues and stuff, Shaul really does a good job here of, of talking about our freedom in Messiah. And having that freedom in Messiah, um, we are... I'm, I'm going to start nudging. <laughs> Having that freedom in Messiah, um, we we recognize the beauty that we have uh, in our forgiveness. Because I'll tell you, it's easier for God to forgive us than us to forgive ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and here's another concept to to this. I guess if if we look at it a little bit different here is um, um, the Bible tells us that when we ask for forgiveness, that God forgives us of our sins and he takes them and he casts them as far as east is the west. And he says, and I remember them no more. So I think what happens is, is God can forget them and we have to trust him at his word. He says, I remember them no more. That's a powerful passage there. But I look back at my past sins and I don't, I remember them more. <laughs> I don't, I don't come from a perspective where I, where, um, um, uh, where they are forgetful in my mind. It's easy to forget of some of those things. But when I look back at the sins I committed and I look back at the hurt and the pain it brought, not just to my family, but other individuals and, and to myself, it's very hard for me to forgive myself in a lot of areas where the Lord has forgiven me. And I think that Shaul being a human, I think what we've done is we've turned him into superhuman. So what, what a lot of people have done is taken Shaul and put him up on a pedestal and made him superhuman as if he had no feelings or no issues and no problems. And I think that Shaul, I mean, he he constantly talks about the shipwrecks and all the stuff, taking 40 lashes minus one, all those physical ailments, all those things that took place in his life. He tries to bring himself into this real person. And he even says, man, I keep doing the things I don't want to do, but the things I want to do, I can't seem to do. He puts himself in a very human perspective to keep, to remind his his disciples that and to the people he's been teaching and traveling and ministering to to remind them that he is human too and he makes a lot of mistakes just like anybody else but he trusts in the undeniable faith of god and uh or the ability of god and so i i think for me i i've kind of come to that argument because i just i see how shaul struggled internally on some areas that i would have struggled i could imagine being a witness to the persecution of the believers I couldn't imagine um, seeing Stephen Stephen killed right before me, and then and then being given cloaks so that I can approve of that. And then it, they went on a tirade. If you look at the scriptures, it didn't stop with Stephen. He wasn't the only martyr. He was the first martyr. And then it continues on, and he persecuted the congregation so much so that by the time he even goes back to Jerusalem, which we read at the beginning here of the book in the book of Galatians, by the time he goes back to Jerusalem. He only met with a handful of people because they were all still afraid of him. So his popularity of, 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 of discipline was so huge that people were afraid to, to meet with him and they thought it was a trap. So so imagine I couldn't imagine being in that situation. And all of a sudden you find Yeshua and then he says, you, you have this struggle with you and you're asking God, take away this pain. I just, I can't take away this stuff. I'm beating myself up with this all the time. And, 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 and Shaul even talks about the fact that when God says my grace is sufficient for you, it was done in a way to keep him humble before the Lord. So uh, anyhow, good question. That was a long answer, guys. I'm sorry you guys had a long answer there, Jarrett. And uh, But Thomas, thank you for your input. Uh, J Jacob, one more and then we'll move on. No, I just wanted to add to that. Just like, I know we like talk about the superhuman quality, like that we put him on a pedestal and stuff, but like, like this dude was like such a like I feel like I know him in the sense that he was such a hardcore dude and he just like he was a like a man like a real man and he just took everything he took everything and he was super like hardcore like he loved Yeshua so much he took everything for him but the other thing is that like when you kill a man which I don't know thank god I don't know 
like I've accidentally killed animals, it changes you forever. And he didn't just kill one guy. He killed a lot of innocent people and dragged children away and killed them and killed their parents and killed a lot of just innocent people. And like, you don't just like turn around and go, okay, yeah, I'm fine. Like he, he has to wait, he has to like have fevers, like fever nightmares and fever dreams and wake up from all the people he killed. Like, I don't blame the guy, like, you know, like I that I feel like that's his thorn. Like he killed so many people and he has to live with that every single day. And those people didn't even do anything wrong. And that alone is like that's punishment enough. Yeah, it's huge. And when you get to that perspective, I think for me it's easier to see that it wasn't just a physical ailment that he was dealing with, that this was a true internal battle that he was fighting with that was a thorn basically in his flesh, that it, it was constant, that's something he had to fight. And when you read his writings and you read it in a very human way, you can see that Shaul was somebody who experienced all these emotions and freedoms uh, that he talks about for us, for there is no condemnation for those who are Messiah Yeshua. He talks about all these passages. You read the book of Romans, you read the book of Ephesians, Corinthians, and you see how how much, how much he has forgive, been forgiven. And the scriptures do say that those who have been forgiven much will forgive much. And, and that's the cool thing is that when you know the sin that you were involved in before you got saved and it was heavy sin, it gives us the freedom to experience God's forgiveness in such a way that sometimes it can go the other direction where we forgive people too easily. And we allow that forgiveness to come back into our lives and hurt us over. We don't necessarily always build boundaries that are really important and good for us to do. So, yeah, very good. Excellent. Well, let's move on. Um, where am I? Verse um, 17. Verse 17. So we're here in verse 17. They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to exclude you so that you may make much of them. It is good to be made much of for a good purpose at all times, and not only when I am present with you. So let's go back up and read it again. Um, he's talking here about uh, serving other gods, uh, physical and you know, uh, well, how could you go back and you know, and to these elementary, elemental, elemental spirits and all this kind of stuff. And then he talks about, hey, you guys were once on fire for for me. You guys would have given me your eyes if you could. How have I become now an enemy before you? How could you guys? You know, how could, and they make, you know, and then he tells them, he goes, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? And then he says, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to exclude you so that you may make much of them. It is good to be made much of for a good purpose at all times. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the pain of childbirth until Messiah is formed in you. I wish I were present with you now. And could change my tone for I am perplexed about you. So what he's saying here is getting back to the influencers in this situation. And he's saying, listen, man, they're they're taking advantage of you is pretty much what he's saying here. Is they're trying to get you to feel that your freedom in Messiah is not good unless you get circumcised. Your freedom is not good unless you do A, B, C, D, E, and F. And unless you walk the way we see it, um, uh, your freedom isn't real. Okay, so that's kind of what he's getting back to. He's going back to this. Shaul writes that way, by the way, if some of you guys didn't know it, he will he will say something. And it's a very Jewish way that he writes. For instance, you read in, uh, in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And the earth was without form and it was void and all. He goes through this whole process. And then he goes, and then this is on the account of how God made the heavens and the earth. Then he goes back and he tells that. Then he goes back and he says something else. And then he goes back to the author of Genesis, which most of us believe is Moses. He's going back and forth. He tells you what it is. And then he goes back and explains it. Goes tells you what it is, goes back and explains. Shaul speaks very much the same way. Shaul will lay out a lot of stuff. And you're like, whoa, what is he saying here? He'll lay out a lot of stuff. And then he'll go back and explain it. Um, and when he does, sometimes we miss those little explanations. That's kind of what he's doing here. He's perplexed. He's he's um, he's confused why they would continue to be swayed by the influencers. Why the influencers are using them, taking advantage of them. He's he's perplexed. He's he's kind of he's not perplexed, but it's it's like one of these things where he's like come on guys, you know better than this. And again, remember, that's been our theme of what Shaul's been coming. You guys know better than this. You, you guys remember how much you loved me, how much you were willing to give your left eye 
for me, how much you were willing to die for me. And then now you're kind of being drawn back into these old customs. You're being drawn back into what other people are saying that you should do and how your faith should be in Messiah and your freedom in Messiah. So this is really how they were. And then so we get to verse 21. It says, tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? So he's throwing this question right back. And okay, so you guys who want to go this, this full out way of committing, uh, I mean, of, of, of being circumcised. He goes, now, are you, are you trying to tell me that you will not listen to the law? So what do you think he's saying there? Anybody? Okay, it's a tough one, isn't it? Okay, so, and that's why everybody's like all silent. So tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One of the child, uh, one, the child of, a, of the slave was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman was born through the promise. And so that's what he's basically saying. He's saying, listen, you want to be subject to the law? Let's talk about the law. Okay, what part of the law do you want to be subject to? And this is what, so it's kind of a lawyer reasoning that he's doing here. Um, this is really cool, actually, by the way, because within the law is grace. Within the law is freedom. Within the law is the promise. And so a lot of times when people get very legalistic around you, they make it seem like the law or the Torah has no grace or no freedom in it whatsoever, that it's a bunch of do's and don'ts. And if you don't do this, you're going to hell. And if you don't do this, you're going to hell. And if you do do this, well, then you might as well keep all of the Torah because there's no way that you can. So they, they either go all the way one way with it or they don't go the other way at all. And what Shaul is saying here is, listen, if you really want to follow the law, and this is what he's saying at the, this verse 21. So he's saying basically here, you could translate it this way. So tell me, you who really want to know the law and really want to get to know the law and walk according to the law, do you not also want to listen to this? Because if you don't listen to the grace and the freedom of the promise of the law, then you're missing out on the Torah. So he's saying, basically what he's saying is don't argue what you don't know. Right. Think about that for a minute. You never want to argue the Constitution with a constitutional lawyer unless you know the Constitution really, really well. Whether that that lawyer is on the left or the right or whether that lawyer thinks the Constitution is no good for today and it's outdated and you think it's it, it, we need more of that Constitution to stand on. When you argue with somebody who knows what they're talking about, you find yourself being a fool at the end of your own stick. <laughs> OK, and, and that is so true. Um, unfortunately, that happens a lot. And I think that uh, what we want to do and so what Shaul is saying here is, listen, if you guys really you guys really don't know what you're talking about here. You want to subject yourself to the law through circumcision, but you don't understand the law, the law itself. The law within the law tells us that we are children of the promise, not children of the slaves. Even though the children of the slave was born by the flesh and the, the child of the promise was born of the spirit. Um, uh, was born through the promise it's still he was still born in the flesh but he was born through the promise right and we know that jacob and esau right i mean isaac 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 and esau so we know that there's a one is the line of the promise the other is the line of the flesh okay so that's all he's saying there guys is he's saying if you guys think you know the law all right let's talk about it let's talk about torah kind of cool huh so, I mean, kind of gives you a little insight into that. So now this is an allegory. So now he goes on and he says right here. So he basically is saying this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman in the fact is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other one corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, you ch childless one, you who bear no children, burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pains. So uh, let me let me finish that thought there. For the children of the desolate woman, woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. So basically what he's saying here is there's a difference between the children of the promise and the children of the flesh. And that is true. So really, when you boil it down to here, whether you're Jew or your non-Jew doesn't really matter in this situation because you're either children of the promise or you're children of the world. 
And, and that's what Shaul's getting across them. This is why he's trying to tell them that circumcision is not the way to go. The outward action of this flesh is not what makes you righteous before God. Now, it might make you become, uh, what do you call it, um, Jewish, right? You, a convert into Judaism, but this isn't what makes you righteous. And this is what Paul, Paul means when he says that there are some that are, are Jews that are not of the promise. Remember when he says that? Remember when he says they might be Jews of the flesh, but they're not Jews. Of, they're not the heirs of the promise because when they're not part of the heirs of the promises, they have not been born again. They have not been set free by the same grace of our sin that we all need to be set free from. Um, they rely on, on their fleshly cut or their circumcision or being part of the tribe of Israel, that that makes them holy in, in their own right. And he's saying, I'm sorry. That's true of the flesh, but it's not true of the spirit. Those who are born of the spirit are born into, to, you know, of, of the promise. And that's where Shaul's taken. So he's using the Torah to argue with them against the arguments of the influencers of telling them, listen, if they think they know the law, they really don't know what they're talking about. The law has the promise and we are the children of the promise. And this is why you and I are together on this. This is why Shaul tells them that I'm with you guys on this. And you guys are with me on this, that I'm one of you because I'm part of the child of the promise. It's not because he left Judaism and it's not because he somehow stopped being Jewish. He's saying, I'm a child of the promise, just like you guys are children of the promise. So why go back to be enslaved to the flesh when we're both children of the promise, whether we're Jewish or non-Jewish? See what I'm saying? So that's why at Beth Yeshua, we celebrate our uniqueness, but our oneness in Messiah. Linda and I celebrate our uniqueness. Um, Linda has been in Messianic Judaism for 30 some plus years, 36 plus years, 35 plus years, whatever it is. She's been involved in Messianic Judaism for that long, but she was, she will not tell you that she's Jewish. She fully embraces who she is, but she also knows that she is, she is set free in Messiah. She's part of the promise and it doesn't matter whether she's Jewish. On my end, I don't really care whether I'm Jewish or not, but I know I'm the child of the promise as well, but I'm happy to be Jewish as well. Even though um, Sephardic Jew in me and Ashkenazi Jew don't make up the, the full percentage of me or doesn't make up the majority of me. And, and I hated doing the DNA test because every time I do it, I seem to keep losing. Not every time I do it, they refine their updates. And as they do their updates and more and more people are in the database, I keep losing a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm like, no, you know, I'm going to become a blob here pretty soon when it's all said and done. But, uh, but anyhow, the, uh, the idea here isn't whether or not we are children of the flesh, as opposed to the fact that we are supposed to be children of the promise. Amen. So we're all children of the promise. Okay. So uh, let's take a look here. So where am I at? I've been reading a lot. Okay, here we go. Uh, chapter four, verse 28. Unless anybody has something to add. Anybody else have to add or anybody have a question at this point? Okay, good. All right, let's continue on. Um, all right, so we have here verse 28. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise like Isaac. But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. And that's really truly what it boils down to. The Galatian believers here were being were being um uh, persecuted by the influencers and uh, which we talked about the, the influencers could be many different groups of people it's not just the jewish non-believers it could have been gentile believers uh, or gentile righteous gentiles who converted to judaism and because they converted to judaism and said hey because we went all the way and got snipped and became part of the tribe here you guys need to do it too your guys's faith in the messiah alone is not enough and so persecution arose because of that. And again, these influencers could be a, a many number of people. Okay, but he says, but just, verse 29 again, but just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. That is an absolute amazing statement right there. It's very, very important for us to understand this statement here. Okay? So it isn't by Hare Krishna. It isn't by following the, the 
uh, you know, all the legalities of the Torah. It's not through Muhammad. It's not through Confucius. It's none of this. We have an inheritance that is given for every single person, Jew or non-Jew, okay, that is a child of the promise, the one that has been born of the free, free child, not one of the slave child. Okay, now he's using Esau and Isaac here, and it is kind of sad when he's using them because he's using very fleshly terms here. But again, he's sharing an analogy, right? He's sharing a story here or an allegory, he's sharing a story. And we have to understand this. We do this all the time. We use stories all the time to get across truths. We use examples uh, that we, we experience every day throughout life. And so as we experience these examples, it's important for us to, to take what Paul's saying here too. He's, he's sharing an example of, of Esau and Yitzhak and how one was made because this is what they did. This is what Abraham did out of his own hands. He could not trust God. Sarah could not trust God. Sarah gave her handmaiden or her, is that what they called it? Handmaiden? Um, Sarah gave her maid, her, her, uh, her, yeah, handmaiden or whatever, gave her handmaiden to Abraham and said, listen, have a child because I'm not going to be able to give you one. So don't we find ourselves doing that all the time where we don't trust God in a situation. We try to make it and force it happen in our lives where we force it to happen. I mean, we do that all the time. Uh, we're not exclusive to this. And uh, we try to we try to force God's hand sometimes. And God's going to say, listen, I'm still on the throne. And it doesn't matter what you do. You can throw a, a, a pow. You can pout. You can fall on the ground and start kicking your arms and legs. You can do whatever you want to do. But I'm still God. And I'm still the father. And I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. And I'm still going to discipline you according to what I want to do. But there are times when we come to him and reason with him. And that's why he says, come on, let us reason together. You know, when I, I remember when um, Nathan, my oldest son, came to me one time and really asked something. Um, he was pleading with me to do something and, what, and the way he approached it, the way he talked to it at first, I said, no, but then he talked about it and he reasoned with me. And I said, you know what? That's a pretty good argument, son. <laughs> that's, that's a, you know what? Yeah, go for it. And I think it was just like going over to his neighbor's house to play before dinner. It wasn't a big, huge thing, but it was like the way Nathan described it was like, you know, kind of like, I'll be out of mom's hair, you know, and she doesn't have to put up with me and I'll be over there. And, you know, I'm not going to get dirty and I won't do this stuff and I'll come back and I'll be back in a half an hour for dinner. It was kind of like the way he said, and I said, okay, sounds good. You know, why don't you go ahead and go type of thing. So uh, there's times where God will allow us to plead with him and talk to him about situations, but our trying to manipulate God isn't going to work. And what Abraham and Sarah did was try to manipulate God's promise through the flesh. And this is why Hagar and Ishmael um, are considered, or Esau, I'm not, nah, no, not Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael, right? Am I right on here? Um, where am I at? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, they tried to make a child of the flesh. And then, but then the child of the promise was who? Yitzhak right? So Yitzhak was the, the child of the promise. And this is all basically saying, so everybody understand this part of the passage of what Paul's saying here? It's important to know that when you accept Yeshua as your Messiah and your Savior, you've become an, a child of the promise. Therefore, you have this inheritance. And the scriptures say that to all the promises of God, they are yes and amen in Messiah Yeshua. Anybody know how many promises are in the scriptures? Anybody just a, a rough guess? There's over 30,000 promises in the scriptures. Think about that for a minute. That's good odds. <laughs> okay, 30,000 promises are yes and amen in Messiah Yeshua. Okay, outside of that, those promises don't mean much for you because you'd be a child of the flesh. And the inheritance isn't for the children of the flesh. The inheritance for the children of the promise. So this is that's a great, great language there. So he's saying, guys, listen, man. And I love how he says, he says, so then, as chavarim, saying, so, my friends. Or he'd probably say, as chavarim shali, so, my dear friends. You are children of the promise, not children of the slave. We are together, one in this, Jew and non-Jew together. And that's a beautiful thing, okay? And then watch what he says here, and I, and I love it. And then he goes on to explain. Again, he says something, and then he argues it. He does a great job at this. This is, Shaul's just such a great writer, and he's a great uh, uh, debater. Or what do we call it today? A debater? An apologist. 
He's a great apologist, and he argues his point very well. Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Messiah has set us free. For freedom, Messiah has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Again, when a non-Jewish person reads this in the church in the modern day, how are they reading this? They're reading it as if these people are going to go back to the Torah. And they're going to say, see, you can't go back to the Torah. You can't go back to the law. So this is sadly misread all the time. And, and it really, it's, it's hurtful. It's actually disappointing in a lot of ways because there's a lot of people back there that are supporting doctrine that isn't found in the scripture. And they're, they're just, it sounds good. It's stated truthfully. It's stated, it makes sense to most of us. But again, pagans didn't follow the ways of God according to the Torah. They just didn't do it, right? Why do it? Why would you, if you were a, a pig-eating, loving pagan... <laughs> <laughs> or a, 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 a love eating baked pork and well i mean it's that's good stuff no no <laughs> okay but if you did all that and you did all this other stuff and you did and you followed all these other things and you had these sexual escapades in the temple of diana and you had this and you're eating this and you're eating that and then you find messiah and then find out whoa whoa i was set free from this sin that i was in would you know this is what Shaul was saying? Why are you going back to that? He set you free for freedom's sake, and yet these are all things that you thought you needed in your life, but you don't need these things in your life because that's not where you're going to find true happiness. And and so think about that for a minute. Why would they go back to some kind of practice of Judaism? They wouldn't have because they were they didn't want nothing to do with that, right? So uh, they were pagans. They enjoyed they enjoyed. All the freedoms that they had in their sin. Jarrett, your hand is raised. Yeah, that's just, it's just such a strong thing in this church, in the church world today, that, you know, even keeping, even keeping Shabbat is a Very yoke good. of slavery and all, and the, keeping the feast of the, the Lord's feast is slavery and, you know, try, you know, trying to honor the Torah is slavery. I mean, that's just such a, it's a rampant thing. And, you know, um, I've tried to talk to some Bible teachers, you know, in, on the side and through social media and tried to, you know, in, in love, try to correct them. So, oh, you're a Judaizer. You know, and I know like, you know, you had, you had taught on that before that that wasn't that didn't wasn't always a, a negative term it was a good you know it was a good term at some point but you know of course they don't their heart is uh in, in a very negative you know you're you're a slaver you want to you want to pull people back into slavery and i don't know how this got so twisted around yeah well it it definitely took place by 150 a.d and then by the time 200 a.d this is why i've encouraged everybody to read that book our hands are stained with blood um uh, by michael brown and i i still have copies of those and i encourage everybody to get one um as far as definitely those who are going into messianic judaism outside of the church world you've kind of been part of the church world and now you're becoming part of a messianic world i would encourage you to read those because when you read them you'll discover that it's really uh it's shocking to find out i mean by by 200 a.d even earlier than that um uh Jews that came to faith in Messiah had to denounce anything that was Jewish, anything. And they had to eat pork. During the Spanish Inquisition, uh, you were forced to eat pork to prove that you were no longer a Jew, that you converted to Christianity. Um, to this day, the two, uh, the two biggest celebrating feasts um, during, during the year, Passover, I mean, uh, uh, Easter and Christmas, uh, you get an Easter ham. And you get a, a, or a Christmas ham and an Easter pork roast, right? I mean, it's like these traditions settled into where they became normal. And 
most Christians today don't have a hatred for Israel, especially if they're evangelical. So we don't we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in that perspective either. We have to we we need to understand that. Um, and most believers, most Christians out there, really do love Israel and pray for Israel and hope to see Israel get saved. There is a love for that. But you're very right, Jared, or not very right. That doesn't sound very good English, or not very good. That's not good grammar. There we go. I'll start right there. Good grammar. Okay. Um, what happens, what happens is instantly they are thought and discipled and trained in Christendom that as they read this, they see the Torah as the negativity. So they, so when they read this, they read it as dismissing anything that sounds Jewish or anything that sounds Judaic. And so when they, when you read terms like this, where he sits there and he says, he says, why go back to a yoke of slavery? They instantly go to Judaism, instantly go to Judaism here. And I do not think that Shaul is at all going. He's I don't think there's anything in his mind whatsoever about the yoke of slavery being uh, the Jewish halakha of that time, especially being set free in Messiah and walking according to God's ways in a way of freedom. He's not telling them that they're going to go back to this yoke of slavery. What he's telling these people. And here's the argument. Here's where they want the cake and eat it, too, type of thing. It's wait, wait. They're they're set free and they're brought close to the Messiah and they were they were non-Jewish people, but somehow they're going back to this the yoke of slavery by going back to Jewish things. Doesn't make sense, does it? Just two plus two does not equal four here. So if two plus two does not equal four, then we know there's something hinky going on here. So so unfortunately, most people don't stop to think about that. They just instantly go to that, what you were saying, Jared. They instantly go to this. This uh, and so th this will go to Judaism equals bad, Christianity equals good. It's slave slavery on one end, it's freedom on the other. And so when you're talking to a pastor, you're talking to a teacher, a Bible teacher, you're talking to anybody, they're going to trigger that um, that uh, what's the word for it? There's a Greek word for it. Um, but what we do is we form an argument. Let me let me just put a test here. Let me just just say this real quick. Let's do the little test. You ready for a little test? Mm -hmm. How about Linda will be my test subject. Let's do a test okay. subject. So let's say we're in an argument about, um, you pick the subject. Biblical, an argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what kind of argument? Um, well, from Galatians, I'm justified by faith. Okay. Okay, that might be not a very good argument because we both okay. agree on that one. Okay. <laughs> Okay, wait, let's say let's say we are arguing about something, and I say something like, um, let's say I, some, I say something like, uh, um, when God created the heavens and the earth, um, that He also um, He also created aliens and other planets. And even you guys, when I say He created aliens and other planets as well, what are you thinking when I say that? What comes to your mind? What what argument comes to your mind right away? That's not what the word says. Or whatever you the tell word, the word doesn't say anything about aliens on other planets okay so that that argument right there she just formed an opinion before i even finish that thought she's already formed that opinion okay when you're in a heated debate with somebody and you're arguing with somebody i don't know if you guys have done this but husbands and wives can attest to this completely this is why we cut each other off in arguments all the time is that before the person even actually gets to finish the other person has already formed inside of them an opinion and just wants to argue that point of view they don't even want to wait for somebody to finish what they're saying they want to interject and bring their argument and so the scriptures tell us that these are deep seated rooted uh, you know paul when he talks about this i think it's in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, he's talking about these being strongholds. These strongholds are these deep thoughts in our heads that we have of pride in our mind, of belief. We have a belief system inside of us that is so quick, so quick to form opinions that when somebody says something that's contrary to what we believe, we start forming our own opinion and want to go into that apologist, apologist mindset, that argument mindset, and argue our viewpoint. Because we all formulate these thoughts, right? This is where Shaul also says that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the heirs. Why? Because they influence our way of thinking. 
All right. The world that we're fighting in this government system that we're fighting or trying to to walk against in our own walk with God there there. It's a principality and power of the air that's leading these the deception out there. We can argue in the flesh all we want, but we it's a deeper battle that we're having. So when when Jared is talking to Bible college professors or other Christians or, or trying to bring light to the scriptures in this area, they'll go back to those deep seated arguments and those roots that they learned that that they were taught even because it it's what makes up our psyche okay and that psyche is so quick to argue and so quick to respond and so that's where we struggle at that at times okay so uh yeah jacob and then let's move on but that was really good jared that you brought that up i just wanted to go back to to a previous thread real quickly just to make a bigger point if that's okay just for it's like like two minutes so with Rav Shitul, um when we said like like the thorn in the flesh, I just want you to imagine that that you killed all those people and then you go into their community and they're nice to you and they accept you. That would break a person. And when he said that it heaps coals upon your head when you feed someone, your enemy, he was talking about himself. Yeah. And it's also in the Tanakh, right? So he's also thinking about that too. Yeah, you're right. Very good. Very, very good. Uh, Jared, did that help answer uh, kind of what you brought up there? It, I did, well, you didn't really ask a question. You were just kind of formulating a thought there. But it's true. I mean, anything we say, like if you guys hear me preach a sermon, I'm guaranteed that before I'm done with my sermon, you've already formulated thoughts for me or against what I'm saying. <laughs> and you may never, ever speak it or say it, but we all formulate those thoughts. And this is why husbands and wives sometimes can go at it um, in such detail against each other sometimes this is because our we let our psyches lead us sometimes. And that's what Shaul is saying here, too. OK, so anyhow, when you read verse one in here. And most Christians, especially if they're, they've are they been walking with the Lord and really trust the Bible, really trust the Word of God, and really do their best, they're going to argue this argument is against the Torah. This argument that they're going to formulate is against God's Word in the Tanakh because they've been set free from the Tanakh, which is funny because even non-Christians or non-Jewish Christians that came to the faith didn't follow the Torah. <laughs> so how are they going back to a yoke of slavery? Right. It, if it doesn't make sense in our modern day, but why would it make sense in Shaul's day? OK, so verse two. So he goes, listen, Shema. OK, I, Shaul, am telling you that if you let yourselves be circumcised. So now he's using this. Messiah will be of no benefit to you. And what does he mean when he says Messiah will be no benefit to you? That Does that mean that they're going to be um, that God will not be reachable? No, he's what he's saying here is the freedom that you found in Messiah when you first believed him in faith with all the inheritance is of no benefit. It's of no benefit. You're you're basically taking your inheritance and you're saying, uh, I want that penny instead. Right. And that's kind of what he's saying. Messiah won't be of no benefit to you because uh, the freedom that you have in Messiah through faith and being a child of the promise no longer means anything to you. That's what he's saying here. So he goes, once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. Again, he's going back to this thing. It's by it's uh, it's either works or through grace by faith. Right. Um, but the works we don't dismiss, but that's not how we're saved. Again, our identity is in Messiah. Our identity in Messiah, whether we're Jewish or non-Jewish, wasn't through circumcision. It was through faith and uh, being children of the promise, and it's also being circumcised of the heart. So that's all he's saying here. And he's saying, but listen, if you decide to go this way, like there are so many people on our around us. I mean, there are so many people still to this day that start falling in love with Messianic Judaism, that start falling in love, they start reading the scriptures and, and really say, wow, um, this is enlightening. This is opening my eyes. And then they just fully convert to Judaism. They're totally missing the point of Messiah. And, and so therefore, Messiah has been no benefit to them. You see this happen in Messianic Judaism all the time. And it saddens me because they're they're leaving the church world in the sense of not the church world, but this 
of they, they want to experience more of who God is because they don't seem to get the answers to some things. And as they find Messianic Judaism and say, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Oh my gosh, I got all this freedom. And you see it, they start walking in that freedom and they're so excited about it. And they're just, they're so on fire for the Lord. But then they start falling in love with the rabbi says this and the rabbi says that and the way we wear a yarmulke and what color yarmulke we wear and, and our seat seat and how long is our blue thread through our seat seat. And do you tie it? Do you tie your seat seat? by the yud hey vav hey or you do 613 for the torah do you do this and do and they get so confused in all this stuff and then they start reading the talmud and they get even more confused and by the time they do you know what just forget all this i'm just going to convert to judaism and they left yeshua behind so in today's modern world we can be like shaul and say the same thing to this guys if you think that that being circumcised is what makes you right before god then Messiah has no benefit in you. And then again, I testify to every man out there that lets himself want to be fully converted over to Judaism, that he is obliged to obey the entire law. Okay? And there's no way you can do it because we know the law is a schoolmaster. The law reveals our sin. The law points to Yeshua. So you, you cannot run from it. So you, verse 4, who want to be justified by the law, have cut yourselves off from Messiah. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit by faith we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Okay, let's stop right there, and let's look at circumcision and uncircumcision. Again, during Shaul's time, he referred to the Jews as circumcis the circumcision and referred to non-Jews as the uncircumcision, okay? So a lot of times in his writing, you'll see he'll either say Jew or Gentile, but when he gets very specific, he'll say those of the circumcision and those of the uncircumcision. He's basically saying the Jews and the Gentiles or the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people or those who through who are Jews according to circumcision and those who aren't according to uncircumcision. So he says here in verse six, highlight this, write it down, or verse five and six, for through the Spirit by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision, nor, neither Jew nor Gentile counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. So we have a higher calling as Messianic believers. As Messianic believers, whether we are Jewish or non-Jewish, we have a higher calling, and that calling is to be children of the promise, to walk according to faith, and to have love for one another. And when we have love for one another, we love each other the way we love ourselves or we love Messiah, then there's grace, there's freedom, there's forgiveness, there's uh, mercy, there's an obligation of love and an indebtedness of love and forgiveness. Uh, another thing that's really cool is uh, Matthew 18 principle doesn't even become uh, powerful. I mean, we talked a little bit about Matthew 18, I think, last week or the week before, or I, or somebody I was talking with or sharing with. But if we decide, and I heard this from Pastor Wayne Cordero, a mentor friend of mine, if we decide to forgive the person who's offended us before we ever go to them one-on-one -on -one with the Matthew 18 principle, then we've already won, whether that brother receives us or not, because we chose not to get offended. We chose to walk in love. And that's what Shaul sa is saying here. He goes, the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. When we extend grace and mercy to one another, when we can extend, um, you know, what saddens me is when people leave Beth Yeshua or any Messianic congregation in the area and they come and visit Beth Yeshua. And typically, a lot of times, you don't have people who are sent out from one congregation or the next congregation uh, with laying on of hands and blessing them and saying, you know what, thank you for being a part of us for a while. We really enjoyed having you. We're sorry that you feel like you have to go, but may you go with God and may wherever you go be a blessing or something like that. I wish that was the way how we move from one community to the next. But the way most of the time how we leave from one community to the next is we have an issue with what somebody said, somebody did, a brother or sister or the leadership 
or, you know, they didn't serve enough chicken at the own egg, so I'm out of here, you know, type of thing or something like that. Or, you know, somebody brought pork. Oh, my gosh, God forbid, man, da, 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 you know, close down, you know, bring out the hoses, wipe down the entire own egg area, you know, and, you know, send somebody away, you know, and 40 lashes minus one. And we do all that kind of stuff. Do we, do we really think that that is honoring God? And so when we can say, when when Yeshua, when the guy comes to Yeshua and says, how many times shall we forgive our brother or our neighbor? Is it brother or neighbor? Brother. brother. And he goes 70 times 7, 490 times. It's very hard and difficult to do it. If you take the letter, the, the, the letter of the law and you say 490 times, it's very hard. Okay. It's very difficult to forgive somebody 490 times in a day. <laughs> if you take the literal sense. But what this is, is an idiom basically saying there's no limit. There's no limit to how many times you forgive your brother and Messiah. And so we forgive our brother and our sisters in Messiah before we ever talk to them about an offense that they did that hurt us or something that damaged us. We've already won. We've already won whether that person receives us or not. And the scriptures say that if you go to them and they receive you, then you have won your brother over. And you know what? If you go to them with an attitude, guess what's going to happen? Exactly what we were talking about. We do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the air. So if we go to somebody with an attitude of unforgiveness and we tell them what they did and how they offended us, we will never, ever, ever get them to respond the way we expect them to respond. But if we go to somebody out of humility and we've already forgiven that brother or sister in the Lord, a lot of times when we approach them, they can receive from us because they see a heart of mercy and a heart of, of love. And a, and a great attitude and even if they still say hey you know what can i think about this for a little bit or i'm not really prepared uh i wasn't really prepared for this this kind of shocked me that i'm sorry i hurt you but i still believe what i believe it's like well I'm, it's fine that you believe that way brother but i just wanted you to know that that hurt me and i've forgiven you for it oh wow okay i mean you find most of the time that you'll win a brother or sister over more when you walk to them and you talk to them and follow the matthew 18 principle if you've already forgiven them before you even get there and the beautiful thing of that is matthew 18 principle should never ever ever get to the leaders in the congregation when that person's kicked out because you've already walked a practice of forgiveness see what i'm saying if you forgive somebody 40 times or 70 times seven 490 times okay basically on no limit to how many times you forgive them then you will see that god will do a beautiful thing there and you're you'll be you'll be set free so it's a good time to stop right there. We'll stop right there. Uh, we'll do chapter five, verse seven, and then we'll work through there and we'll try not to babble, along, babble on as much as I did tonight. You know, some of you guys were starting to sleep. I saw you guys falling asleep. I, I took notes here. I wrote it down who all's falling asleep. So uh, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But before we close tonight, is there anything anybody wants to add? Anything that... Uh, Anything that you're hearing or, or something that you're learning tonight, something that you heard maybe for the first time and you want to share with us? Uh, Linda, go ahead. So in order to tell my church friends that the Torah is not slavery and does not, what does Galatians say? Um, does not make Messiah of no benefit to me. I, I think that I would point out that I can only be justified through the atoning work of Messiah. I can't be justified by what the Torah puts forth, not in the same way, for sure. The animals are not available for sacrifice anymore, but everything else is still good. It's just the justification point. Right. It's the identity of who we are in Messiah. And we're justified by faith, right? We're justified through the work of the cross and what Yeshua did, not through the animal sacrifice. He's our propitiation once and for all, right? So again, this goes back to identity. Very good, Linda. Um, and that's, the, that's, that's where she would argue that point. And I would agree with her on that. That's a good point to argue because you're coming in with a, with a perspective of saying, listen, um, I'm not in yoke. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, not, I'm not in slavery to the Torah when the Torah tells us to love our father and mother, you know, uh, to honor them, to, to not commit adultery, to, to uh, honor our brothers and our sisters. Messiah. How are these things slavery? Right. And, and even Shaul says, if we're going to be a slave, let's be a slave to, 
to each other in Messiah. So out of love and a pure heart and a devoted heart. So very good, Linda. Um, anybody else want to want to add to anything? Jarrett, go ahead. You have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I mean, I I can also see how this can be so easily, can you know, a confusing subject when it says, "Hey, you know, he's saying if you're going to be circumcised, you you know, you're going to have to you're obliged to obey the the entire law, you know." And then because w with with us we because we love Yeshua, we want to obey the Torah as much as we can. We want to live by according to the Torah as much as possible. You know, but I can understand how someone outside of that understanding can get so confused to think, well, we're trying to get salvation through our works, you know, living, living this life. But you know, a statement like I, I kind of wish Paul would have said, hey. We, we we try to live our best by the Torah because we love Messiah, but we're not saved through that. We're saved through our faith in Messiah Yeshua. I think in a lot of but ways, he, say that. <laughs> I think a lot of ways that he is saying this, he is saying that, but not the way we would hope. We like you said, I wish he would say it this way because it's a whole lot easier. Even Peter Kepha is like, man, Shaul's hard to understand sometimes, guys, but. <laughs> But, you know, and uh, but I think it's true. I think and if if the other thing is here is if we relate uh, what Shaul says to family, to familial circumstances, it's a lot easier when it comes to obeying the Torah and and our identity. If our identity is not based on circumcision and our identity is not based on on works. OK, it's easy for us to say that. Like my children, they are Bernals, not based on their merits. They didn't do anything be to become a Bernal. They didn't do anything to be part of my family. Uh, but they were raised with expectations. And they were raised with, with uh, uh, expected harmonies within the family. They're all individualistic. And they all have their own views on things. And they all have their own thoughts and their own desires, their own dreams, their own passions, all those things. But they are still part of my family. And they're going to make decisions down the road that can that can break them or make them or hurt themselves or hurt others. OK, but they are still part of my love of my family and they will always be my children no matter what they do. And I will always love them no matter what I do. But as they were growing up, I gave them a standard to live by. And that standard is very was very difficult at the time. I, had, I was very strict on my kids. I, I wasn't a military strict, but I was strict with my kids to the point where. A couple, you know, one of my kids are like, you know, uh, they have a hard time with me right now. They, they, <laughs> because I was too strict on them. But then when they look at their their cousins or they look at other family members or they look at other families, they're like, wow, I'm glad I was raised the way I was raised because I see them out of control. So I guess in the same kind of sense, if we use Paul's language in the term of, of familial things, and we can sit there and say, listen, um, this is what the family of God acts like and behaves like because our identity is already in Messiah, but this is how we act. This is what we do. We don't do what the heebie-jeebies do down uh, next door. I'm going to say heebie-jeebies because I've never met somebody with the name heebie-jeebie. But if their their last name is heebie-jeebies, you do not want to be a part of that family, okay? Because they will give you the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> but let's say the heebie-jeebies right next door, they have a whole different standard of living. They steal. They cheat. They do whatever they can. You know, they come into your house and they act like your friends. And before you know it, they're take, walking out with the, the chicken dinner, you know, out of their hands to go feed their kids and their family. Okay, that's a whole different standard of living by. And I think that that's where Shaul, if we can understand our identity is in Messiah, not through circumcision. Our identity is through faith and we're promises of the heir or the inher inheritors or our inheritance is in Yeshua and all the promises of Yeshua are yes and amen for all those who believe. And we're talking over 30,000 promises in the scriptures. And we've been given this with no merit whatsoever, except for the grace of God and our belief in Yeshua as the Messiah. Then there's no amount of walking according to the Torah by getting circumcised or going out to the red tent once a month, all the women get together and get on motorcycles and go out to the red tent out there in uh, Destin, you know, up by the uh, um, the Everglades. <laughs> I don't know why I said motorcycle. Why not? Why not have a motorcycle gang with all the ladies, you know, during the that time of the month on their red on their motorcycles? <laughs> No, 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 no. 
<laughs> my mind is so crazy, guys. I come up with all kinds of stuff in this head, man. This head can... Okay. But regardless, no amount of acts of walking according to the Torah is going to do it for us. And that's what Shaul is getting across. But he's not saying for us to dismiss it. And he's not saying for us to not walk according to the standards that are set before us as the family of God, as the children of the promise and the children of the inheritance. We have responsibilities that we have to uphold, right? It's like Brewster's Millions, if you ever saw that years and years and years ago, where uh, Brewster had to spend, um, uh, I can't remember what it was, 10 million or 40 million, he had to spend it like in a month, mm -hmm. and he couldn't, and he had to spend it all, and he didn't know why he, if you guys have never seen it, it's with, uh, it's with the comedian, I can't remember if there was any curse words in it or not, or whatever, but it was back in the 80s, uh, but Brewster's Millions, and uh he had to, but then he would, he would, he was spending his money like he bought a boat. And then the lawyers would say, no, that's still an asset, you know, and he, he wanted to give it all to charity. And he got a, he got a, a tax deductible receipt and they go, no, you can't, that's still an asset. You know, he had to get rid of all these millions of dollars and it, it just wore him out. He didn't know how to do it um, type of thing. Uh, what, with us, we've been given such a huge inheritance. Why throw it away? Why throw it away? Oh, Richard Pryor. Yes, thank you, indeed. So why throw it all away when, when we are set free in Messiah, whether we're Jewish or non-Jewish? And that's the point. That's the point that Shaul is saying here. Very good. I, li I like your statement there, Shaul. I wish, I mean, Jer I wish Shaul would have made it that simple, but he is saying it that way. But he's remember, we got to talk. We're, we're trying to get back into first century, into this Judaic understanding, this Judaic system, and Shaul speaking to a, a group of non-Jews that have been influenced to be circumcised and to be a part of the family of God through circumcision, therefore converting fully to Judaism of that time or that Jewish practice of that time in Galatia that is going to bring them their identity and Messiah. And this is where we're going to read here coming up that Shaul says, man, I wish these guys would just cut the whole thing off. <laughs> right? He, he uses some heavy duty language here. Um, and so it's the same way with us today. Our identity is not in whether we're Jewish or not Jewish. Our identity is not in our, yomika, our yomikas or our traditions. It's not in that. It's through faith in Messiah, Messiah alone. Amen. And this is why at Beth Yeshua, we want to give you guys the freedom to wear a yarmulke if you want, freedom to wear a prayer shawl if you want to wear a prayer shawl, freedom uh, in these areas, whether you want to grow a beard or not grow a beard. But if you start getting very legalistic, you start growing out peyote and you start doing all kinds of stuff and you start telling everybody else, they telling everybody else that they have to and you start driving a rickshaw. Is that what a uh, rickshaw? Or what is it? Uh, Segway. Segway, you start doing a segue to, to the congregation. You know, it's it, it's a fun story, but some of you are like, what? Um, down in Miami Beach, I'll tell you guys this last story. We'll call her good for the evening. This is a great story. I'm driving Uber, and I'm driving. I picked up somebody, and I start going uh, to Miami Beach to drop them off at Miami Beach. And this lady's visiting, and her son is with me in the, in the back seat, and we're talking about stuff. And when she found out I was Jewish, she had some questions. And so she was a Christian and asking a bunch of questions. Her son had some questions. And then finally, her son said, can I ask you a kind of a personal question? I said, sure. He goes, why do Jews drive around in Segways? So, and why are Jews in Segways? And I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she goes, she goes, there's like Jewish people with their little tassels. You know, I go with the pale. And she goes, yeah, the pale. And they have their things on. They're driving Segways down Miami, on my, in Miami, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Okay, so this just this was a couple of years ago when I first moved here. So I was getting to know the layout of the land. So I'm driving them right down through the, to Miami Beach, and I'm going down there. And then all of a sudden, we look over and we saw probably four or five Jewish men, you know, with their their pale driving segways <laughs> down on the sidewalks. <laughs> and we, I started, I started laughing. <laughs> I started laughing so hard because I thought, oh, my gosh, you're not you're not joking around here. This is real stuff, you know. And uh, and so I said, you know, I honestly don't know why I've never seen this before. But it's like the ones that you saw right in the segways downtown were Jewish people. They weren't non-Jewish people. They were Jewish people right? segways. Maybe it's a mitzvah not to walk a certain distance. You know, it wasn't on Shabbat. I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea, but maybe we'll, we'll send Jacob after this. Jacob, you have to get the answer for us. Why do we see so many Jewish people in Miami driving Segways? <laughs> Hold on. Let me go ask my mother and then come back with like a bunch of bruises on my head.
Yeah. Okay, go ask your mom. I'll wait. I'll be glad to wait for it. Go ask your mom. <laughs> no, go, I go down at 10 30. Hey, mom, my mom's in her pajamas. Hey, why did Jewish people ride Segways? And she's like, chased after me with a newspaper. Hey, okay. Here's your Hanukkah present. <laughs> <laughs> But it is interesting to me. But anyhow, that's a fun story. So just getting across on all that thing is that is that we follow man-made traditions and we make up man-made traditions all the time. There's nothing wrong with traditions unless they go against the word of God. And unfortunately, a lot of people get into the traditions of Messianic Judaism along with Judaism, along with Christianity. There are some homes that have several different traditions. Uh, some people in Messianic Judaism still practice, uh, practice Christmas. And you know what? I mean, if you're going to celebrate the birth of Messiah and people are getting saved during this time, if that's your choice, go for it. I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not saying you're going to hell in a handbasket type thing. You know, uh, her family celebrates it. My Some of my family celebrates it. I'm going to call him and say Merry Christmas. Don't forget that Yeshua was, the, was Emmanuel, the Son of God. He died for you and he loves you and wants you to be in his kingdom. Uh, more people get saved on Christmas and in Easter than any other time of the year. Um, so we can use this time to really reflect on, on our Savior and share how, how circumcision or Hanukkah is not uh, the substitute. Hanukkah is its own thing, right? And it's not just Jewish practice that makes us set free in Messiah. It's truly him. It's his work that he's done for us. And all of the Torah points to him. So this is what Shell is trying to get across to, to the Galatian believers. Anything else before we close? the house of the risen